Okay, any questions about the broker? So now you know more than you ever possibly wanted to know about the broker and how Android works with respect to the binder and AIDL. Uh, again, believe it or not, we've just only scratched the surface of this very, very rich topic. So if you're really into this, if for some reason you're working for a company that has to go in and modify parts of Android in order to get its requirements met for its customers and users, you're going to have to dive down even deeper. But at least now you know kind of how things are put together and it'll help to focus your attention on the part that matters for what you're trying to do. Okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about, and this will really be the last set of patterns on these topics unless I get really inspired and, and think of one more between now and Wednesday, which I probably won't. Um, we're going to talk about something called the publisher subscriber pattern. And we're going to describe first what the pattern is and kind of how it works, what problems it solves, and then we're going to talk about how it's implemented in the context of Android. So here's, here's a way to think about the need for this pattern. There's a bunch of system-related status information that's kept on your behalf by Android that is often useful to applications in one way or another. For example, the Android middleware and the lower level drivers and system services keep track of the battery levels, which is a very important thing because if you're running low on battery, you probably want to know about it so you can be alerted and plug your phone in or switch the battery or do something like that. The issue there is how do apps find out that the battery is low? Imagine you have the phone app, right? You could be in the middle of a phone call. Your phone app isn't busy doing anything other than, you know, helping make sure that that call's quality is good and, and managing things like three-way calling or caller ID, right? The phone app really shouldn't be sitting there being tightly coupled to the battery status module, right? Well, why would the phone app need to know about the details of monitoring the battery level? That would be, if you hard-coded the phone app to know about that, you would have a very tightly coupled design that would break and be brittle as you tried to make changes. Likewise, having the, the app continually ask some service, are, are you running low of battery? Are you running low of battery? Are you running low on battery? Well, pretty soon you'll run low on battery because you'll spend all your time asking whether you're low on battery, right? It gets, it's like having your kids say, you know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Because uh, it's not making it go any faster. It's just getting to be a lot more painful. So a polling-based model isn't really the right way to go either. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to define a way to automatically publish an intent to anybody who happens to care about the status information that Android's keeping track of, like the battery levels or other, other kinds of things, you know, or um, service, service quality, you know, like your cell, cellular signal strength. You might have something that says your cell signal is getting weak or whatnot, you know, move into an open area or, or whatever. So whenever the, this information changes, you want to be able to notify interested subscribers that something has happened that they may be um, concerned with. So here's how this works in Android. We define these things called broadcast receivers. We've talked about them before. And they have these on receive hook methods that get called back at the appropriate time. And you can register these things by using a variety of means. You can register them by register receiver. You can register them using uh, things like the underlying Android manifest files, you know, whatever you need to do. And uh, what will happen there is that, that tells the underlying system, actually tells the activity manager service, I care about these kinds of things. So if those kinds of things occur, let me know about it. So in this case, a phone app might say something like, hey, uh, I want to know if the battery is getting low. And then later, when the battery service, through some lower level means, connected probably to hardware uh, device drivers and that may actually pull stuff periodically, um, when it starts to realize the battery is getting low, it will go ahead and broadcast out the battery low action as an intent. And that will inform anybody who happens to care about this that the battery is getting low. And then each of those things can do whatever they need to do in order to be able to handle this. They can pop up a dialog, or they could you know, shut down certain system services. They could dim the screen. They might drop your call. And it might you know, change the speed at which you're downloading a file. You know, whatever it is that you're trying to do, different parts of the system might react to battery being reduced in different ways. And of course, battery is not the only resource that might get low. Right? Memory can get low, so you may have other kinds of things to keep track of memory availability as well. Just as a quick note, this example, like many examples, have a variety of patterns involved. So we've got activators involved here. We've got brokers involved here. Typically, we've got proxies involved here. There's all kinds of other stuff taking place. 
But the particular pattern we're going to talk about here that does this kind of magic callback approach when something happens that you're interested in, that pattern is called the publisher subscriber pattern. And this is a very, very, very popular uh, pattern. It goes by different names. Um, we'll see that in a second. So one name is publish subscribe. But publish subscribe is really dealing with the actions or the verbs, whereas publisher subscriber is dealing with the nouns, the things. And most patterns are described, many patterns are described in terms of the nouns like adapter or bridge, not the actions, adapting. Right? You don't have the adapting pattern, you have the adapter pattern. So here we call it the publisher subscriber pattern. And the intent of this pattern is to notify event handlers, which could be subscribers or observers or broadcast receivers or whatever you want to call them, when something interesting happens uh, based on publishers or observables or subjects or whatever you want to call these things, when somebody's state changes, when something evolves, like the battery becomes low or someone notices the battery becomes low. So when an interesting state change occurs, you want to be able to notify interested subscribers that something has taken place. There's also a gang of four pattern that's very similar, although not identical, to publisher subscriber. That's the observer pattern. And the intent of the observer pattern is to define a one-to-many dependency between objects so that when one object changes state, all the dependents are notified and updated. So they're very similar to each other. In my, in my mind, the observer pattern is very, very, very commonly used uh, if you're within the single address space. You have a listener or something that gets, you have a bunch of listeners that get dispatched when something occurs. And the publisher subscriber pattern is typically used more when you're trying to go across ad address spaces. <clears throat> Although that distinction is somewhat a bit artificial. Take a look here for more information about observer. So let's talk about when you might apply the publisher subscriber pattern. So one way or one time to apply it is when an abstraction has more than one aspect, two aspects. One of them depends on the other, right? So in, in our example here, we had battery voltage or battery level. That was one thing. And then we had things who depend on battery level, like the phone app or something else on the, on the phone. So there, there's multiple aspects and one depends on the other. The behavior of some services or some apps may depend on the state of the battery. Likewise, when a change occurs to one object, like to the battery level, we want to tell potentially many others. It might be zero, might be one, might be n, where n could be very large. So we don't, and we don't really necessarily know how many there are. At least the guy who is monitoring the changes doesn't know how many there are. So you may have to notify an unknown number of things. So we have to notify a number of things, and those things may need to change. And something else, just to make it interesting, not every object is always interested in every change by every other object. So there may be some need to be able to filter or um, winnow down the number of interested subscribers that need to be informed when some publisher decides it wants to tell people that things have happened. So those are the conditions under which you would typically apply this particular pattern. So here are some of the structure and participants. As always, this maps just beautifully onto the stuff that you find in Android. There's something called an event, which in Android is an intent. That's easy. There's something called a subscriber, which is the thing that consumes events. In Android, that's a broadcast receiver, among other stuff. There's other things besides broadcast receivers, like uh, content observers and stuff like that. There's a, a way to filter so that every, subject, every subscriber does not receive every event. That's done through something called intent filters. There's various ways to define those. You can define them programmatically, dynamically. You can define them statically through manifest files. It's up to you what, you, what you want to do. You have a publisher, which is used to create the events in the first place, or the intents. In Android, that's typically a service or an activity. And then finally, you have something that serves as the mediator, the traffic cop, that routes the information, the intents, the events, from the publisher to one or more subscribers if their filtering criteria is satisfied. That's what's called the event channel. And in Android, that's handled by a variety of things, the context working in conjunction with the activity manager service. So those are all the different pieces mapping the concepts of the pattern to the pieces of Android. And that should be helpful because once you understand how it works in Android, pretty much every other intent system and uh, event system has a lot of things in common. Here's a quick summary of the dynamic interactions in this pattern. It starts out by having the subscribers register with the event channel. Uh, some systems require the publishers to register as well, but it's 
that's more optional. It's almost always the case subscribers register. And the event channel keeps track of that stuff. When the publisher detects something that's changed that it thinks others may be interested in, it then goes ahead and notifies. It, it publishes the event. That goes to the event channel. The event channel says, there are all these different subscribers. Let me see which ones actually care about this particular type of event. Maybe it goes to everybody. Maybe it goes to some select few. Maybe it goes to some quorum. Lots of different alternatives there. Those things get pushed along and eventually they get delivered to the actual subscribers themselves who will then go ahead and, and consume the event in one way or another. Any questions about that? Pretty, pretty conventional thing to do. You'll, you'll find this used all over the place, probably too much actually in, in practice. So there's a number of benefits and liabilities of using the publisher subscriber pattern. On the good side, it allows publishers and subscribers to vary independently. You can have different, um, the publishers don't have to know about the subscribers, the subscribers don't have to know about the publishers, they just have to know about something in common which is the event channel. You register, you get notified, you don't really have to care about that kind of stuff. Think about uh, services that you might use or you might be aware of that work this way. Twitter is a good example. Um, if you want to follow Lady Gaga, why you want to do this, I don't know. But if you want to follow Lady Gaga or Miley Cyrus, because um, you like to see a train wreck unfolding in real time, you know, um, then you can subscribe to their, their Twitter account and they don't really know who you are. They, they don't really care who you are, by the way. <laughs> they just want to know that you're a fan. And so as they go about the crazy things they do in their lives and tweet about it, you'll be informed, right? So it's this sort of anonymous communication. They can, in fact, it doesn't even really have to be them. It could be their, their handler out there, uh, you know, just trying to, try to patch over a rough spot to make it look good or whatever. So the publishers and subscribers can, can vary and be different. Uh, you can add any number of subscribers you may want. So you might have one, you might have zero, you might have a gazillion. And the different subscribers may choose to treat the data in different ways. So, you know, some people, when they get the, uh, the tweet of, of uh, Miley Cyrus's latest, you know, music award thing, they may immediately rush out and watch the video. Other people may call the network to complain. Other people will, you know, take a shot of, of vodka, you know, whatever they do. The different people can react in different ways to the information that's coming out their way. And so you can customize the behavior. So those are some really powerful positive things. And what you end up with when all is said and done by using publisher subscriber or event-based communication of this form is you end up being able to have a loosely coupled connection between different parts of your system. So things are more evolvable, they're more customizable, they don't have to all vary in lockstep. And there's more, even more sophisticated things you can do here. There are some downsides though. One of the problems you can get into is you can end up with, because the publishers and subscribers don't really know about each other, you can end up in situations where you have a storm of, of communication taking place that nobody really realizes they're, they're propagating and yet because of the aggregate effect of this, the system becomes wildly overloaded. Uh, there was a great example if you take a look at email storm on Wikipedia. There's a bunch of examples of email storms and uh, there, there's a great example of Microsoft where they pretty much melted down the Microsoft Exchange server 15 years ago or so because they people hit reply all and they didn't realize it and everybody kept hitting reply all. The story I always like to tell about this is back in the early days of email when I was first starting out as a, as a grad student in the late to mid 80s, people weren't as, um, they weren't as, as accustomed to getting lots of unwanted email as they are today. I mean, let's face it, anybody these days who gets upset about a piece of spam is probably picking up, you know, probably focusing on the wrong thing in life to get upset about. You know, you get, a, you get an email you weren't expecting, you don't just blow up and go ballistic. I mean, those people in Nigeria really do want to give you all that money, for God's sake, right? So, so the, the point is that we're kind of accustomed to it. But way back in the day, that wasn't the case. And so what happened was funny. Uh, you'd, be, you'd end up on a mailing list that maybe you didn't know you'd gotten subscribed to somehow, or you'd forgotten, or you weren't expecting to get something. And somebody would send a posting out that was a little bit off topic or you just didn't know why you were on the mailing list. And rather than doing what you do today where you just ignore it and delete it, instead what people would do is they would reply back to the mailing list saying, please stop sending irrelevant emails to this list. And of course that would be broadcast to everybody on the list too. And then everybody else would start chiming in, why am I getting all this email I don't want? You know, and before you know it, 
every person is sending responses back to every other person. So it becomes this, this sort of quadratic explosion of emails, and the whole system bogs down, and the internet grinds to a, to a screeching halt, and so on. That's an example of an email storm. And that occurs because you don't really realize that you're actually broadcasting your messages to everybody. You think you're just replying to one thing, but it's actually exploding it out into multiple places. Another problem you get into, and, and you probably also get this with mailing lists you may be on, uh, you end up getting a lot of stuff that you don't really care about. People just sort of send it out to, uh, you know, let's say you're subscribed to the Red Zone channel, and so you're going to get informed every time someone scores a touchdown. Well, maybe you only care if your team scores a touchdown, and you don't care if other teams you don't like score touchdowns. In fact, it might even irritate you to find out that uh, certain teams are scoring lots of touchdowns. So you might want to be able to have some way of winnowing out the stuff you care about from the things that you don't care about. So if you're not careful, you can end up with lots of extra data that you don't really want. Some good examples of known uses, PubSub middleware uses these patterns, uh, this pattern galore. Uh, things like web services notification, data distribution service, Java messaging service, the Corba notification service, all kinds of things in that space. Uh, do this pattern. And the more sophisticated ones really go off the deep end in terms of being able to have sophisticated support for quality of service and other capabilities. And then there's smartphone event notification systems like we have in Android. So they, things like the, the intent service and the binder framework and all the other things, broadcast receivers, those are all examples of this pattern as well. So the bottom line here is that publisher subscriber helps you avoiding hard coding dependencies between publishers and subscribers. So as things change and evolve, you have less rework to do in order to take advantage of changes that may occur in terms of numbers of stuff, what they do in response to stuff, and so on. And also, subscribers and publishers can come and go. And new types can be introduced to the system oftentimes without having to make changes to what's already there. And that's one of the powerful features of advanced PubSub middleware. It's very change resilient in a lot of ways. Um, and the other nice thing is you don't end up having to poll stuff. You get informed when things happen, and you don't have to sit there and repeatedly ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, chewing up valuable resources, including your time, without really knowing about anything until it actually happens. Right? So, so those are basically the, that's basically an overview of the publisher subscriber pattern. Any questions about the pattern in terms of what it's intending to do?